Well, in that case, wonderful. You see, I've got this fabulous backroom team. Fantastic. Excellent. So welcome to Kong 21, to the open mic session. And I'm Paul Omani, and I have the great advantage that there are loads of great poets in the room. And uh, so, and they range from people who specialize in doggerel to people who specialize in haiku. I'm quite sure there are some here, like I see Damien Costello, he usually writes haiku. I can see uh, Geraldine O'Brien, she writes uh, what, tankers. And uh, Cronin is here, and Shirley Gallagher. Well, she she just writes epic, epic stuff. I'd say, epic stuff. And uh, Charlene writes uh, mysteries, always surprising. She is a relation of E. E. Cummings. I just uh, warn you. And Joan Mulvihill. Well, she just paints with her words. And I don't know who the lady with uh, Joan Mulvihill is, but she's left-handed, and she'll be in the second half. Alec uh, Taylor is here all the way from. He's a European citizen. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> Paul, Paul, just say, Claire is very famous. Claire is not reading a poem. She's she's been here all day, just on a separate laptop in another room. I'm just observing. I thought the open. I thought the left-handed question was a was a participant. Look, thing. look. Will you, you, will you go? Will you go? Oh, hi, Claire. Will you go with the flow? I'll go, I'll go with the flow. I'll go with the flow. Okay, sorry about that. Just sorry, think I'd embarrass you. Do you think I would? <laughs> <laughs> I, what? You're no longer left-handed. You're, you're a right-handed person. There we are. Owen Higgins is here as well. Um, Marianne Shine has just flown in from South Africa. She's absolutely welcome. She's not a bit uh, what you think she is. And uh, Cronin McNamara is there. And look, we're going to start off this evening. And we're going... What the poetry session is that we're going to give everyone a chance to do something. And then you will get a second chance. So there's no need to hug the mic. So I don't, I don't mute anybody. But what are we <laughs> going to do? Is I, I'm going to start off. And I tell you what, just to expose myself, because I have something that I want to tell you about me. And it's in the form of a poem. So give me one second now till I till I tell you what this is, because I was in a session today which was all about gender. And it was in that case, it was about some of it was about men and more of it was about women and how they got on together. And over the years, over the years, as he desperately looking on the Internet for his poem and being unable to find it, I will be treating you later on to a poem of my own, which is called I Love Women. So there we are. I'm just uh, coming out this evening as a man who loves women. So it took me a long time to come out, but I, I've i come out now this evening and I'll be reading you that poem. Now, I'm going to yes, give... Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah. And she is a descendant from James Joyce, I guarantee you. So there we are. The, the, we, I now want to introduce you to a European citizen who was born in Dublin. He actually carries an Irish, I've been vaccinated passport. He's a, he's a communications guy. He's big into creativity. And you know what? He spent 11 years on the radio in Germany. Yeah, he used to clean the uh, studios after the shows. He was really, he was top class in that area. And he, he big into corporate videos as well. And he was on television in London once. And nowadays, he just seems to flit around between London, Vienna and Dublin. And I give you the one and only person who can match that description. Please put your hands together. Please pin him and... Uh, Alec Taylor, you are first poet this year. Off you go. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, I just want to tell you that I, I gained a bit of fame in Austria where I lived for a long time. And uh, I was referred to as a spin doctor because I was the first media trainer to appear on the scene in Vienna in the early 80s. So I wrote this piece in 2001 and it's, it's obviously against the whole world of spin doctoring. So it's called Death to the Spin Doctors. And in that summer, I wrote this in May, in June on the 7th, there was an election in the UK. Now, some of you may remember that, the 7th of June. So I refer to that in the poem. 
So it's called Death to the Spin Doctors. Let's grasp the chance. Let's seek them out, the hidden enemy, the puppeteers, animals of the dark. They only show themselves when they're on heat. We have till June the 7th. Prepare the tower, lay out the rack, construct the gibbets, sharpen the short knives, oil the tumbrils, mark out the route. Time's not on our side. Let's haste. Resist, they will, in their last remaining refuge, the tabloids, the gutter press. But catch them, we surely will. Already nets are arching through the air in alleyways. Our men are massing round their haunts. To Ludgate Hill, the women's chant goes up. At last, the spectacle begins. The media mount their rostrum, signaling the start of dire and ritual slaughter. No mercy on these souls, these masterminds of the staging of events. This time they've no control, for tis they themselves will soon be hung, spun, and doctored. Thank you. Oh, God, uh, Alec, you're just too good. <laughs> now, wow. We'll have, you, we'll, have you, uh, we'll have you come back later, Alec. That Thank was, you very much. Uh, that was good enough to get past the you know, well above the minimum I'm standard. Over the bar, am I okay? Yeah, you're just well above that minimum standard. Now, look here, I have a woman for you now who uh, was also originally from Dublin, but she's living near Kong now, so she it hasn't cost her much money to get to <laughs> Kong today. She's been here, hanging around here for about 10 years. And uh, in that time, she's, uh, she's decided that she's going to be a mother to a young boy. That was a good decision, I have to say. That was a really good decision. Um, she's in uh, human resources. That wasn't such a good decision, but don't worry about that. And uh, loves rural Ireland, and that's a great decision. So, look, I give you, please, put your hands together for the one and only Marianne Shine. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Paul. Um, so th this is not my own poem, um, so I'm cheating a little bit, but um, it's a poem written by a lady called Becky Helmsley. Um, and the poem really resonated with me um, as a woman, um, and I hope you like it too. She sat at the back and they said she was shy. She led from the front and they hated her pride. They asked her advice and then questioned her guidance. They branded her loud, then were shocked by her silence. When she shared no ambition, they said it was sad. So she told them her dreams and they said she was mad. They told her they'd listen, then covered their ears and gave her a hug whilst they laughed at her fears. And she listened to all of it, thinking she should be the girl they told her to be best as she could. But one day she asked what was best for herself instead of trying to please everyone else. So she walked to the forest and stood with the trees. She heard the wind whisper, and dance with the leaves. She spoke to the willow, the elm and the pine, and she told them what she'd been told time after time. She told them she felt she was never enough. She was either too little or far, far too much, too loud or too quiet, too fierce or too weak, too wise or too foolish, too bold or too meek. Then she found a small clearing surrounded by firs and she stopped and she heard what the trees said to her. And she sat there for hours, not wanting to leave, for the forest said nothing. It just let her breathe. That's wow. It. Absolutely great. That's fabulous, really good. Can you, can you read us the second uh, part of that poem later on? I mean, that's just magic. That's... I thought it was lovely. I'm glad you like it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Wow. Wow. Now we come to the part of the show where I'm going to call on people who I don't know half as well as I knew the first two people. So I, in a minute, I'm going to be calling on Owen Higgins. Uh, he knows who he is and he can even say a word or two to introduce himself before he starts spouting poetry at us. So apart from that, um, after that, I'm going to be asking a, a woman to go next. So there's a chat here, right? There's chat. Just drop your name into the chat 
Uh, and you know what? If you, you don't have to be next, but drop your names into the chat and then I'll be able to call you. And I'm not going to call the lady who I thought was left handed because she's now turned out to be right handed. So there we are. There we are. So Owen Higgins, the state, doing, Paul? Yours, the state of yours. Paul, thanks a lot. Uh, and everyone, good to see you all again. Um, good to see all the familiar faces. Um, so my poem is called Another November. Um, just a bit of the backstory from the poem. It was written back in 1994 when I was writing a lot. Um, kind of got into IT and stuff like that. Uh, so writing did, wasn't a, a front seat for me. And I, I kind of feel a little bit small amongst all the, the great people here and how, how good everyone else is. But this story was written... Um, well, this poem is about a, a view out of a cottage in a place called Glinsk in Connemara. And I spent about a month of every summer there when I was a kid. I loved, I kind of loved the wilderness, loved this quiet of Connemara. Um, but when you'd look out this window, you could see the Bay of Cashel acro or across the, the ocean. You could see the other side and there was Cashel and there was always these lights flickering um, and I, I always used to think, what was the life like on the other side of this bay, you know, or where, 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 where are these houses and who lived there, you know? Um, anyway, the, the poem, when I heard about the poetry night, I thought, okay, um, I do have this poem called Another November. And it took me a while to dig it out. I didn't know where I'd written it. I, I wrote on a, a blog a long time ago. Uh, it was called Zanga uh, back in the the very beginnings, I think, before MySpace and all this. And I found this on this this blog site uh, that's still there, still kind of an archive on the internet. Anyway, I'll, I'll begin. Um, and as I said, it was written in 1994, so it, was, it is what it is. Anyway, the wind was howling that late November night, and far off in the distance shone a pale dim light. I wondered a while about that light, which flickered disturbed all through the night. My friend lies beside me, a bundle of warm sleep. She begs me leave the light and come get some sleep. But no, I still watch, my eyes sting as they stare. I'll watch till the light is no longer there. Leaves of trees blow to and fro. And for a moment I watch them, those free lively ghosts, skipping, jumping, swirling round posts. But when I look back to comfort the light, it is nowhere around. It is joined with the night. And that's it. Very good. Very good. Very good. Beautiful. Oh. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. It is joined with the night. Wow. I think look, there, was, I there was a little bit more to that, but I can't... I have uh, been... oh. oh, yeah. Oh. Sorry, the end oh. of it was my sentence now over I join her in bed, falling asleep with my head like lead. Anyway, sorry. I was zoomed in too much on it. <laughs> wow. Well, well, well done. Well done. Gorgeous. Fantastic. Oh, and well brilliant. Lovely. Now, I can tell you, I've already got six more poets tearing down the walls. And the, and the one who's going to get, who's going to get the next opportunity. And please, will you do a tiny bio about yourself? Because I, I don't know you at all. And there'll be people watching this in America tomorrow when it's uh, on CNN, you know, so do take Charlene or Carlene, Carlene Little. Tell us who you are briefly and then uh, introduce your poem any way you like. And oh, Bob's your, well, Bob and Bobette's your uncle and aunt. <laughs> I have plenty of uncles and aunts and none of them are called Bob or Bobette. But um, my name's Carlene um, and I've, I've seen quite a few of you in the various huddles, so you'll know that I'm ordinarily found in, in a show in North Donegal. Um, and um, my, uh, my appearance tonight uh, has, is featuring a, a quite an impressive black eye from um, a, a misadventure with a surfboard um, in the Atlantic on Tuesday. Uh, my um, poem is actually something that I wrote on the way here on the long journey down from Inishon, Um and it was inspired by a 
the fact that U2's album Acting Baby uh, came out 30 years ago, I think last week. It was a big part of my youth. So um, in response to that, I wrote this short poem called Mysterious Ways. Warmth and company with no fire will burn, so twist and turn like birds and trees during a storm, a murmur of starlings under the bridge. 30 years on and it's warmth beneath your feet, but you can't find the offbeat. You've stopped moving in mysterious ways. You've become the singer, not the song. Oh, oh. Wow. that's lovely. <laughs> Fabulous. That, that was some journey. 30 years later. Wow. Uh, that, Charlene, thank you so much. That that's You've done the, the people of Inishowen proud with that. By the way, there's another person in the room. I won't tell you who, who's also from Inishowen. Of course, if I get it wrong, she can contradict me. But uh, there's more than one person in the room from Inishowen. There we are. So the next person I want to call on is Connor. What was it, Connor of the Nine Hostages? Was it or Connor, Connor, Connor? Okay. Anyway, Connor O'Brien. That's that's me. Will you take over and tell us who you are, where you're from, and give us your verse? Okay, I'm Connor O'Brien. I'm from Hitchers Town near the Gantes and Knockman Downs, but I'm in virtual in Kong. So this is about Kong. To Kong, with thoughts in two dimensions I come, and then friends nipped, tucked, and scored along the lines to form a frame. It shows their pace, their shapes, and thoughts and stands more solid a maker's piece of work from Kong. Thank you all. Lovely. Hey, wow. great stuff, Connor. Thank you very much. Now, I wonder where the next woman is from. I just know she uh, she's a painter. And uh, before she was a painter, she used to hang out on computers. And you know how we all know that no one who's ever gone in for coding or for anything like that would know how to wield a paintbrush, but she's exceptional. Joan Mulvihill, come on, tell us where you're from and introduce your poem. Hi, thanks, Paul. So I brought my lovely assistant. You sit down there, Karen, now make yourself comfortable. I'm the I'm a prop. This is my prop master. I'm gonna hide. You 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 hold that hide hide. So um Thanks, Paul. I can't write a line of code to save my life, but um, I painted this, painted this uh, a week ago, and um, so I sent some people earlier on. My dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and dementia during the summer, and so I've done a series of paintings that are called the Living Years paintings, and they're they're about um, throwing everything at the canvas. So these are pieces of plywood, and they're they're hammered on with brass tacks. And it's a particular field on the way from here to my parents' house. And, um, and so anyway, it's all about him, but I was thinking it's his plowed field. So I don't know if you can see that, this plowed field bit at the bottom. And that's where the water catches in, in the furrows. But anyway, I found this Heaney poem and uh, it's, it's to go with the painting. And so he says it better, but obviously when I, it was in hindsight and coincidence, I talked about saying my piece on leadership about the quality of followers and this poem is actually called <clears throat> follower so and marianne i blame you if i cry because you <laughs> set me up badly for tears <laughs> well now i can start crying <laughs> my father worked a horse plow his shoulders globed like a full sail strung between the shafts and the furrow the horse strained at his clicking tongue. An expert, he would set the wing and fit the bright steel pointed sock. The sod rolled over without breaking at the head rig with a single pluck. Of reins, the sweat team turned round 
and back into the land, his eye narrowed and angled at the ground, mapping the furrow exactly. I stumbled in his hobnailed wake, fell sometimes on the polished sods. Sometimes he rode me on his back, dipping and rising to his plot. I wanted to grow up and plow, to close one eye, stiffen my arm. All I ever did, sorry. <laughs> okay. You're doing good. Brilliant. All I ever did was follow in his broad shadow around the farm. I was a nuisance, tripping, falling, yapping always. But today it is my father who keeps stumbling behind me and will not go away. Very good. Oh, that's, oh, that's really nice. That's really You're nice. Good. Joan, I have to say that you brought Seamus Heaney back into the room. I'm really sorry about the tears, Marianne. It's not really your fault. It might be the wine also. No, don't be. That was beautiful, Joan. Honestly, it reminded me of my own dad that passed away. So thank you. I mean, mine is still here. He'd fucking murder me. <laughs> <laughs> now, the purpose, one of the purposes of poetry is to allow emotions to be spilled. Mm -hmm. So that's why you get poetry on births, marriages, and all the other things that happen. So wonderful. I'm so glad we had tears in the house. Mm. Brilliant. Lovely. Now I've got I've got somebody who isn't going to cry. <laughs> I, I guarantee you this is terrible. I'd buy a pint to you uh, if he does cry during the reading of this poem. He's a really strong guy. And, you know, real men don't write poems, actually. But <laughs> Ronan McNamara, Ronan, come and confound the critics. Tell us who you are, where you are, and introduce your poem. Thanks, Paul. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Yep. Um, you inspired me to write this poem, Paul, just about 30 minutes ago. So I scribbled it down. Uh, I'm Cronin from Dublin. I'm a real bit of a techie at heart, love building things, love building products. I run a company called Creme Global. I'm actually in Kong tonight. And my poem is uh, about Kong. Hang on. Who's that? You can't compete with that. I get, I'm feeling emotional, Paul. I might just get a bit well. <laughs> okay. Kong has a special place in my heart. So here's my poem to Kong. Are you ready, Paul? And everybody? Yeah. Okay, here it goes. Peaceful solitude, space to walk and think. Leaders, followers, huddlers, the multiplicative mats of ideas. Friendships made, another year, another congregation. Oh, yes. excellent. Superb. I can just see, I can just see Owen Kendi driveling. He's going to, or driveling. He's going to put that in the, you know, testimonials, you know, yeah, yeah. bound to go in, bound to go in. Right. It's time for a woman now. A woman who hasn't yet had a chance. And I want to invite her. I don't know where she's from. I know that her first name has only one syllable. Only one syllable. The last person had two, but we've got to get right. As a, Jill, Jill Berry, come on. Perfect. You're, in, you're in charge. <laughs> Thanks a million. I'm Jill. I'm from Westport. Um, so I've been to congregation quite a number of times and absolutely love it. Um, this poem, I don't normally do poetry or read poetry at all. I certainly don't write it. So um, a little bit like Joan, my dad has Alzheimer's as well. He's, since my mum died four years ago, suddenly we kind of noticed things were getting progressively worse. Um, so just after lockdown, I suppose, he, you know, he needed to get out of the house. So we went off on a drive down towards Kilmina, if anyone knows it. Um, it's outside Westport. And we were going to go down towards the graves, to mum's graves, my brother's graves and things like that. And we decided to have a venture because dad's parents or his, his father was from Kilmina, a place called Meower. And as we were driving around the old areas and the old looking where his grand aunts and different people had lived, we kind of came across this honesty 
box and some plants and tomato plants. So I just stopped off anyway. And this man came out to talk to us. Maybe he thought we were dishonest, but we weren't. <laughs> so I uh, came out to talk to us and just got chatting. And within about two or three minutes, he was, he was only down the road from where my grand aunt was. And he said that he was in the pub the week before. It was literally after lockdown. And someone had handed him this piece of paper, which was a poem by my grand aunt. Now, I never met this man before in my life. So this poem was by my grand aunt and, and my grand aunt was Auntie Annie, we used to call her. Uh, she would have been kind of a, a cross old lady, but I kind of really, really admired her and loved her. She would have been by the fire, you know, the turf fire, the open hearth and everything else. Uh, she was a spinster and the reason she was a spinster as well, she had a lot of heartache. Her first boyfriend and who she got engaged with was in the Irish army. So I'm assuming it was in the 40s. He was captured and they, he went on hunger strike and died so she actually never married so the poem is called solitude i don't know when she wrote it i assume she wrote it when she was quite old she died in the 90s in 98 and uh, this is about uh, from by anne fahey or auntie annie in meara Kilmina. so she it called solitude and funny enough it really reminds me of what's happening today and the loneliness that's involved with with most people in COVID, especially with the older people so solitude I sit alone at evening tide and watch the shadows fall, where all the friends I knew of old, now no one calls at all. Those golden hours are past and gone, so are those changeless friends who ne'er forget the friendly call I hoped would never end. Now things have changed when I was young, what sadness I recall. Now with speed and greed and no creed, no one cares at all. Very nice. Very nice. Wow. Yeah. And I have Very Googled nice. it, so I'm assured it was in her handwriting. So I assume she didn't plagiarize it, but um, it was lovely. And that was only a few months ago. So, wow. wow. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a woman from outside Portland here today, Ginger, her name. Mm. And she was going around telling everybody that they really were who their ancestors made them. So, mm. There you have an example, Jill Love, one of your more recent ancestors coming to life here in Kong. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, I'm going to read you a, a poem of my own to finish the first half. But I've got a warning for some people in the audience, you see, and the chat is here. And this is the warning. Billy Kennedy, you're not off the hook yet. Owen Kennedy, you're not off the hook yet. Geraldine O'Brien, you're not off the hook yet. Damien Costello, you're not off the hook yet. Uh, Cormac Kennedy, you're definitely, we're waiting for you. Uh, Zanga, Zanga and Patrick Flood and, and uh, Billy O'Connor and Shirley Gallagher and Vincent Kerr. You're all on the second half, right? So here's the last poem in the first half written by me, and it's actually the first poem I ever wrote. This will tell you how naive I was. It's called I Love Women. Mm -hmm. I love women. I admire women. I am jealous of women. I am enriched by women. I have been saved by women. I love the shape of women, the flaws of women. I am infuriated by women. I love cooking for women. I am irritated by women. I despair of women. I am tickled by women. I write for women. Women have made me a man. Very good. Very nice. <laughs> very That's nice. great, Paul. Beautiful, Paul. Thank yeah, we'll all come well, down to dinner. That was very good. Very <laughs> courageous. I read that. I read that poem on um, March the eighth. Yes. Help me if I get it wrong. Every single year, mm. and I wrote it in nine ninety nine ninety five. Actually, it began, and uh, it's it's my view of women, and I I think every year have I changed my mind. And I haven't yet changed my mind. So there we are. 
So look, that's the end of the first half. You can all uh, get writing because you know, poems that have been written in the uh, in the break, we'll have a three minute break, um, can always be read in the second half. And uh, pop all the uh, names in the in the chat now, because uh, all of you who read in the first half will get a second go. But of course, you do realize that all those who didn't read in the first half, they'll be going first. <laughs> So cheers to you all. Cheers. 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 Hey, hello. Can I do a shout out? I feel like I'm on the radio. Can I say hello to Patrick Flood? I haven't seen Patrick in the real world since we worked together in DCU and we were on the same corridor <laughs> and you're always so lovely and supportive and I just want to say hello and thank you. Hi, jo hi, jo hi John. I wish I, I wish I had known of your, uh, your artistic abilities. Oh, uh, well, no, I was really good nice to see you today. And I was like, yeah. oh my God. We could have we could have had some better conversations. I think. <laughs> you know, I'm the shy type. I never told anyone. There and, you go. <laughs> and Patrick and Joan, for those of mm -hmm. our audience in America and Australia, DCU is uh, stands for what does it stand for? Uh, Dublin City University. Right. Right. Yeah. And so I was there for a brief two years at the end of the corridor, and uh, and so yeah, and that's how I know Patrick. Fantastic! I see loads of names. My goodness, if you get your name in the chat to me privately, you might just barely be squeezed in the second half. So you know, just to let you know, who's that, who's that impersonating Carlene? That's not Carlene in Carlene's camera. Aha! Uh Aha! -huh. Uh -huh. There's somebody, uh, I thought Z A N Y A was how you spell um, Zenga, but uh, it's, apparently it isn't. Okay, we're starting the second half now. And by special request, all the way across many counties, many mindscapes. <laughs> in everyone's imagination during the day today. Let me call on the first new voice in the room. He knows who he is. He's going to represent his masculine side with this poem. His feminine side he's demonstrated all day. But uh, Owen Kennedy, off you go. <laughs> well, you, you put it up to me, so I decided I would go to Google and find something. <laughs> I'm thinking thematic, so it's not my poem. I don't even know who wrote it, but I'll call it out. It's called My Favourite Leader. Oh. Nothing is the sun. Nothing is the moon. Your beauty is so charming. Wider than the sky, higher than the hill. Your mind's so striking. Deeper than the water, proper than the water, proper than the sea. Your honesty is so engulfing. When I see your face, no tension, full of peace and grace. You are the leader of leaders. I am dying to be one of your followers. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Doesn't that remind you of the poem attributed to, to St. Patrick? Fantastic stuff there, Owen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I tell you what, after that, we are going to have to have, I can't let anybody who hasn't spoken yet come next, because to follow that, you have to be a really experienced uh, person. I'm going to call on Marianne Shine, because she's the only one I can rely upon to follow that well enough. So, Marianne. Well, Paul, I already, I, I already read in the first <laughs> half, so I've no more material. Sorry. <laughs> Look here, you are material in your own right. Yes. So that's tell, true. Us, tell us a very brief story, and the people in the background can write it in the form of a poem. So you have yourself one minute to tell us a story now. <laughs> oh my God, Paul, you really put me on the spot. I have like no idea. Night again. 
So, yes, exactly. I, I'm sure now somebody else would like to tell a poem rather than me tell a story. That story about the baby camel. Um, how about, how about um, Billy or is there anybody else going to Can Marianne, can I, can I, in the spirit of the stand-up comedy night, mm -hmm. before, yes. prove that I'm not in a completely emotional wreck, oh, give yes. me my stand-up version of Brace Yourself, Men, because Paul loves women so much. I'm going to tell you my funny stand-up version of what happened when I went to the breast clinic in the matter a couple of weeks ago. Now that sounds interesting. <laughs> so there is a certain indignity of, you know, having to go to, to the breast clinic and, you know, standing there topless for basically three hours and going through a mammogram. And then there's the indignity of them squirting gel on you as you go through the ultrasound. And more indignity again when you're standing there, you know, undressed from the jeans upwards as you're being felt up by total strangers. But I said afterwards, nothing compares to the indignity of the young nurse asking you, do you know what TikTok is? <laughs> and as I said, how fucking old do you think I am? And as I said that afterwards, no one has ever asked me that when I've been fully dressed. So it's this part of me that looks that old. So that is my contribution. <laughs> well, Joan, that's, that is a brilliant interlude. That is a brilliant oh, interlude. Good. I have to say, I am a fan of TikTok myself. Um, but can I just say, now that I've recovered from that, Paul, I do have a story. It's not that interesting, but it's just something that happened to me this morning. I woke up and I don't know whether this is very common or not, because I'm from Dublin. So, you know, um, I woke hey, Marianne, up. Marianne, Marianne. Before yes. Before you start, I want you to withdraw something. I, I, yes. I call on the speaker to withdraw. It's not that interesting. OK, I have I'm to learn how to do that. that yes, from okay. Mark, OK, you now, may find this interesting. Yes. Um, but I woke up this morning um, and looked out the window and there was a flock of wild geese uh, in the field just behind the house. And I got and I, and I just thought it was absolutely beautiful and fascinating. And I kind of Googled them and, and looked at my phone and they were from Greenland, apparently. And I just thought it was the, the most it was the loveliest thing to sit there and just look at this flock of wild geese that had flown for so long to land in Ireland for the winter, for their holidays. And it actually reminded me of, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Mary Oliver, uh, poet, she's one of my favorites, but she, I think she, um, she wrote a poem called The Wild Geese, um, which I love. So you should read it, it's beautiful, but um, just reminded me of her. And I don't know, I just thought I'd share that with you today, seeing as you asked me, Paul, for a random story. Marianne, <laughs> Marianne, listen here. You do not have to be good. Yes. That, by the way, is the first line of Wild Geese. Yes. You do Marianne. not have to be good. Okay. Yeah. I'm now I'm now going to go. We've had two women in a row, and I can yes. just see the men saying, I noticed, I noticed he's gone all, he's gone all for the women now. So no way, no way at all. <laughs> Alec, Alec Taylor. Come out of your shell and uh, reinvigorate us, please. Well, this is, I'm going into the confessional now, right? Um, I've said that I'm proud to have been born and spent a lot of time in this country in Ireland as well as abroad. I went to school here and one of the schools was called St Andrews College. And yeah, I'm... I'm well, you'll see how it goes, but I'm not proud of um, how, how we behaved back then. Bearing in mind, it was 1950, okay? So the name of the poem is Jam Pot. Your hairstyle was 60 years ahead of its time, bushy, spiked, all over the place. No wax products then. As if you'd been pulled from the rolled up center of a Christmas cracker. We teased you on account of your ugliness, missing our own acting as we were like a herd of gobshites. We picked on you too because you were Jewish, missing the news of the Holocaust, finally extinguished five years before. Jew boy, we'd chorused, chasing you like a wounded animal around St. Andrew's College schoolyard, ignorant gobshites. Where are you now, Jampot? I'll tell you where we are. As it happens, we're in a jam ourselves now, knowing what we know. 
queuing up to apologize to you. That's what we are in the jam we're in. Wishing we could turn the clock back to 1950, take those words out of our gobs, rewind those chases in the schoolyard and give you a hug. Spit out the names Jampot and Jew Boy and tell children everywhere not to be cruel when you can choose to be kind. Very good. Oh, very good. Oh, fabulous. Very, very good. Yeah. Fabulous. Oh. That's lovely, Alec. You say it's lovely. true. I'm afraid yeah. we did behave yeah. like that mm. back then. Wow. Well, uh, that, I have to recover from that. Sorry, guys, I need a drink. <laughs> I'm going to go across to the only person who can kind of follow that, Owen Higgins. And Owen, you, you are, you're on next now. Follow it's that. Funny. You know, I, I just... I didn't think I had another poem and I found one um, and I was like, I'll wait until the end. Now, and then Alex's poem just reminded me of school, you know, and the things you do. And it's interesting. And, uh, you know, some of the language he used as well. I was like, I'm not sure if this one's um, acceptable, but anyway, we'll go for it. I think it was called um, The Morning Poem. I have another one as well, funnily enough. So if we get to the end, there's still time. Anyway, I woke early one morning. The earth lay cool and still. When suddenly a tiny bird perched on my windowsill. He sang a song so lovely, so carefree and so gay. That slowly all my troubles began to slip away. He sang of far off places, of laughter and of fun. It seemed his very thrilling brought up the morning sun. I stirred beneath the covers, crept slowly out of bed, then gently shut the window and crushed his little head. But <laughs> I don't know if that is actually my poem when I look at it. I have another one, but um, maybe for later. Or maybe. Oh, now. Owen. Owen. I don't think Carlene will recover. <laughs> I'm looking at her face. <laughs> okay. The black guy had nothing on that. <laughs> I, I was nervous. I was lulled into a full sense of security and then quite shocked at the end. Well, Charlene, since you're kind of talking, let me not cut across you. I'm going to give you the chance to give us another poem now, please, Charlene. Oh, no, um, that's the only poem I've written 42 years. So uh, it's taken me 42 years to write eight lines. I don't think I can do one on the spot. OK, well, I tell you what, there's no rush. You've got five or 10 minutes before the end anyway. So <laughs> get, get yourself a pen and write one and I'll call you later. OK, I'm now going to I'm now we, we have to have a woman. Sorry, Joan is gesticulating with uh, her oh, index yeah. finger. Pardon? Is, Caroline, is, is that Eilish Irvine, shyly hanging out beside you? She of the recently produced play. Yes. And I do I, think a reading of an excerpt of her recently produced play may be in order. Joan, she, well, just, took a, she just took a call from home, but I am going to, uh, I'm going to get that. Yes. Okay, uh, she's just, yeah. No. Alien, Hold alien. on. Hey, hey, you're chewing up time. Hang on. <laughs> she just had a call from Homer. Give her a chance. <laughs> okay. I'm going to call Jill Berry. Jill Berry, sorry. Jill okay. Berry, are you are you up for another one? Because well, the one I'm the one I've got hovering on my page is uh, is not going to be the last poem tonight, would leave you all uh, feeling too socially responsible. OK, I'll read you my poem then while we're just doing this. Really uh, hasn't done one yet. No. I tell you what, just put his put that yeah, his name in, put that yeah. person's name in the chat. No, I tell you what we're going to do. Let me let me go across to Connor O'Brien. Connor, you are promising to give us something that comes under the influence. Are you willing to deliver it? I'll try. Um, when, I when I stopped farming, I began a bit of gardening. And in the nature of gardening, I had, you know, surplus strawberries and surplus stuff and whatnot. And around that time, I 
read about the, our, our other visitor from Germany who said that in his home village, they used to preserve the sweets, you know, the strawberries and the plums and the whatnot in Kirsch. And they'd add to it all during the year. They'd, another way was they would bring it into the common place in the village and pickle it overnight and then take it back home. They, they, this was a regular thing to do in a while. I didn't have cash and I wasn't going to pay for it, but I did, did have pochin and I could get that easily. So yeah, it worked. Uh, okay. Strawberries <laughs> and sugar and pochin, yeah. On top of that, plums, yes. Um, basically, if there was something cheap and sweet uh, inside in the shop, it went in. This is, and it stayed there for several months until Christmas time. And it produced a most beautiful dessert. It was, okay, the, the colors had faded, but you got something you could eat. And <laughs> lovely. And of course, there was this liqueur left over. And coming on to January, I just take a, a, a tipple of it every night and, it's, and such like. And you see, I'm out of cows now, but all through that January, I nightmare used to come back to me because we're living quite close to the main road. And sometimes cows, cattle, we get out in the road, we're first house in the road, and someone would come to the window and bang. <laughs> You, you'd lift off the bed. You know, this is panic. You, you, knew, you knew exactly what it was. Cows out in the road. Well, I was getting these nightmares all through January. And eventually, with wisdom, I said, is there a connection? And I stopped, <laughs> I stopped drinking Puccine. And the nightmare stopped. And that's my experience of Puccine. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Connor. Thank you very much. Uh, Jill, do you have something for us? Well, I don't, and I don't know how long this will take. It's just when you were talking, Ginger did bring up a lot today about ancestors and various different things. And I did talk a little bit about genetics. And I talked is this about a, is this, Jill, is this a poem? It's not a poem. It's an, a small article from Woman's Way in 1970. How long is it? It's not, it's, not as long as, it's not as long as the last man, is it? No. I'll tell you, leave it. What I'll do is I'll put it up on Twitter for you to look at. <laughs> then, that's wonderful. We'll have some Emily Dickinson. I tell you what, will anyone give us Emily Dickinson? Uh, I, can, I can do an Emily Dickinson. How about uh, Billy O'Connor? Yes, I can do an Emily Dickinson. Oh, thank goodness. Billy, yeah, come on, Dickinson. give us Emily Dickinson. And this is a short four-line poem, but I, I think in times of great uncertainty like now, um, I think we should turn to Emily to Dickinson for inspiration. So I've adapted this, uh, her famous poem, uh, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, I've adapted it for the pandemic. Okay, so here we go. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. I told him that I'd acquired my herd immunity. That's it. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> lovely. Fabulous. Just lovely. Uh, Billy, yeah. I'd work on a few more of her poems, uh, you know, because um, <laughs> you could have a collection there, I'd say. Oh, that... Yeah, I think this, the longer this pandemic goes on, yeah, the, the more material I'll have. Oh, definitely. That's, that's lovely. That's lovely. OK, we need a woman to follow that, please. I'll take a hand. Uh, raise your hand if you're willing to be a woman. OK, there are no women in the house. OK, right. Well, I'm going to read you a poem myself then. And this definitely doesn't come from my my weak side. This is a... Um, this is actually the most recent poem I've written, and I wrote it on the 24th of November. You might like to see if you can uh, remember anything that happened on the 24th of November that really got to you. So here's the poem. 
24th of November. Sailing to Dover. Floating to death on water. We hadn't a chance. Screaming for life, for breath, a hand to hold me, swallowing silence, sinking and drowning, a cold, wet graveyard for home. I hoped for better. Mm. Mm. Yep. Very, Very strong. Very good. <laughs> Right, well, um, uh, you will uh, you will be able to do uh, raise the mood from that uh, pretty uh, grim Sorry. experience. Um, yes. Let me ask, uh, does anyone here want to sing a poem? There are people who sing poems, right? Like, I'll give you an example, you know. I wandered lonely as a cloud that <laughs> floats on high. Now, clearly, I'm out of training. But those of you who are able to pick a better point than that, if you could only sing as well as I could, you'd be, you'd be well off. OK, look. Nobody is volunteering. I know one person who will definitely come on with something. Joan Mulvihill, come on. Come on, I need you, Joan. I need you to uh, give us uh, either a repetition of what you've done already, which is perfectly OK, or give us something new. Not a story, a poem. I'll give you, I'll give you the writing of somebody. Just give me one second. OK. See, when Irish people say one second, it means I've just got to finish my pint and go to the letterus and I'll be back shortly. No, 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 no. So, uh, so I, I read from John Ruskin last year at the very end when we were very, very drunk. Now, Uncle Jimmy took back the book that I had had on lifetime loan for about five years. And he came here one day, he said, can I have my book back? And I'm going, I kind of hope he'd forgotten, but not to be defeated, I bought a Ruskin book in rare and recent books in Kong the last time we were all there in person. And, uh, and I have since, to my great devastation, found out that Ruskin was an asshole and he treated his wife abominably. And if anyone has read or watched the movie, um, the, the Life of Effie, uh, Effie Gray on, on Netflix, you realize um, what a twat he was. But that is not to undo the brilliance of his mind. So we will put it down in the feminist movement to it was a different time. And and his views on nature are thankfully better than his views on women. But um, I always thought this was a great, uh, a great piece that I stumbled upon. And, and that year in Kong, it became my hack in the afternoon because I bought the book at the lunchtime. So I'm going to quickly go to the page. Which I, oh, yeah, here it is. And this is how I like to approach uh, listening to people's posts and how I think we, should, we all generally, I think all of us do this, is approach our calmness. <laughs> if the person who wrote the book is not wiser than you, you need not read it. If he be, he will think differently from you in many respects. Very ready are we to say of a book, how good this is. That's exactly what I think. But the right feeling is how strange that is. I never thought of that before. And yet I see now that it is true. Or if I do not now, I hope I shall someday. But whether thus submissively or not, at least be sure that you go to the author to get at his meaning, not to find yours. Judge it afterwards if you think yourself qualified to do so, but ascertain it first. And be sure also, if the author is worth anything, that you will not get at his meaning all at once. Nay, that at his whole meaning, you will not for a long time arrive in any wise. 
I'm going to leave it there. It goes on. But I always thought that was a really, it's page 25. It's John Ruskin. I mean, he wrote this in the 1800s. And, and I know he's a bit of a twat, obviously, in terms of how he treated his wife. Yeah, Joan, Joan, never mind his wife for the moment. <laughs> Excuse me. But I have to tell you, that was not written by John Ruskin. That was written by Owen Kennedy when he was putting up <laughs> the, the submissions. That was his mantra, wasn't it, Owen? That that is the kind of thing. See, told you. And then, I, and then you planted it in a bookshop in Kong. He planted it in a bookshop in Kong. And actually, absolutely. It's, written, it's in here. There's handwriting on the inside. Oh, 1865. And 1865 is the handwriting on the inside of this. Wow, book. that is a rare and recent wow. book. That is a rare book. Bought well, a rare book. Yes. A rare book bought recently <laughs> again, and and I just think that that is. That is phenomenal. And, and anyone who knows, like, I mean, I wrote some really funny satirical nonsense for this year's Kong, but in previous years, I've often quoted, I've quoted Keats in the past. I, I've quoted stuff from, you know, from, you know, Shakespeare. And there's real wisdom in stuff that was written a long time ago at a different time. And I think real wisdom stands the test of time. Joan, Joan I want you to give us the quote that comes immediately to you from James Joyce. Can you please give us yeah, the Yes, yes, yes. Keep going, keep going. Go, go, go. <laughs> okay. Now, I want a last word. Who wants to have the last word? Because we're finished at eight o'clock. So the, I see a yes man. Brilliant. I see a no man, a nomad. Right, okay, uh, let me see. Uh, I don't well, know what's going on with these emotion emoticons. Sorry, I can't get rid of it. Well, look, I don't, don't worry, don't worry. It's good to be able to say no. You know, there are whole books written about, you know, learn to say no. And you've just given a good demonstration of how to do it. Lovely. Come on now, Are there is there anybody who'd like to go last? Because if you don't go last, you're going to have to put up with me. So there's I've, the- I've got one for you, Paul. Oh, thank goodness. Off you go. Yeah. Well, look, you're just, you're just lucky. I didn't even think I ever wrote another poem. But anyway, this one's called Winter. Um, I wish there was a daisy, a daffodil or two. I wish there was a spider I could sw squish under my shoe. But sunny days are over. It's true, I'm sad to say. I'm dying for that time again when colors come to stay. But why the hell we mull while nature she presents us with a different type of light and smells for our senses. The smell of candles burning or new clothes for you to wear. It doesn't really matter that the weather isn't fair. When all the world is darkness and we're, we're all stuck inside, it's time to sit and ponder all the sunny days we squandered by. So remember, dear friends, when evening skies are bright, that blogging is for winter and summer is for life. Lovely. Wow, that's fabulous. <laughs> very good, very nice. Okay, I'm going to play you out with a poem about Roundstone. Oh, you, have any of you ever been to Roundstone? Yes, so yeah. many times. Oh, love us. Okay, well, see what you think of Roundstone after you hear this poem. Oh, God. It's called a seaweed lorry. How long have I driven the seaweed lorry to Roundstone, past Fuchsia and Mombrisha? How long has the wife practiced acupuncture? My daughter washed dishes. You'd wonder as you pitchfork the algae, watch bits slip off and litter the roads. They can take their time. Wait their turn to pass. I have many more journeys in me, many more days going before hearse and caravan. They can all take their turn. Why should they pass? I've driven this road too long now to be forced off it seen their urgent ways, refused to be edged off my road. There were houses full, 
not enough rooms for the children, before there were not enough children for the rooms. I've seen them all off, still gone back for more seaweed. Very good. Wow. Thank you very, very much. Very good, thank you. Look, thank you all. It's now I'm just saying that the uh, recorded piece, as I'm going to ask Owen to stop the recording, and we can then bring all the body uh, stuff in <laughs> afterwards, you know, Earl of Rochester and all that stuff. So, <laughs> Owen, if you'll stop the recording.